It's a common refrain to say that at some point every child has an Egypt phase. After all, why not? The fantastical imagery of pyramids, hieroglyphs, and mummies can seem like something out of a mystical fantasy story rather than a real period in history. I had my Egypt phase pretty early on in my life, satiated by adventure stories like Indiana Jones and the Mummy movies. By that time, I was also in my space phase, having grown up watching Star Trek and Star Wars. I was obsessed with both ancient temples and mythological monsters, as well as spaceships and aliens. Thus, when I discovered a certain mid-90s Roland Emmerich film, witnessing these two worlds collide felt like stepping through a gateway which I have never returned through since. The idea for Stargate originated with director Roland Emmerich when he was a film student in his native Germany. Rather than a Stargate, Emmerich's original idea was about an ancient spaceship being discovered under the sands of Egypt. After making a few films in Europe, he moved to the USA to make the Jean-Claude Van Damme sci-fi actioner Universal Soldier. The film was a modest success, grossing $95 million worldwide against a budget of $23 million. The film was also the first collaboration between Emmerich and writer-producer Dean Devlin, who also had an idea for a sci-fi movie he referred to as Lawrence of Arabia in Space. Following Universal Soldier, the two collaborated to merge both ideas, eventually coming up with the first draft of a new movie they called Stargate. To help pitch the film, Emmerich and Devlin hired production designer Holger Gross, who had worked on Universal Soldier, and artist Patrick Totopoulos to create concept art for the film. After packaging the art and script, the project was pitched around Hollywood, but no major studio was willing to fund the film. Despite contemporary hits like Terminator 2 and Emmerich's own Universal Soldier, according to Devlin, there was a belief at the time that science fiction was dead. Unable to find financing in the States, the filmmakers turned to Europe, where they found support at the French production company Studio Canal Plus. Eventually, Studio Canal joined with Coralco Pictures to finance Stargate's projected $50 million budget, which was a large sum at the time, but far below the typical Hollywood blockbuster budget. To help boost the film's profile, the production team needed a name actor in the cast, and so Emmerich and Devlin pursued Kurt Russell for the role of Colonel Jack O'Neill. Russell was well known to sci-fi and action fans for his performances in John Carpenter films like Escape from New York, The Thing, and Big Trouble in Little China. By the late 80s, he had also won praise for his performances in dramas like Tequila Sunrise, Backdraft, and Tombstone. James Spader was another name that added legitimacy to the production when he was cast as Dr. Daniel Jackson. Spader was well known for his performances in dramas and romantic comedies throughout the 80s, winning acclaim for his performance in Sex, Lies, and Videotape. He later admitted that he thought little of the script, but enjoyed working with Roland Emmerich so much that he took on the role. British actor and model Jay Davidson was suggested for the role of Ra by the producers, as he had recently been nominated for an Academy Award for his performance in The Crying Game. Davidson was reluctant to continue acting at the time, and demanded an intentionally absurdly high salary of $1 million to play Ra. He was surprised when his demand for such a high salary was actually agreed to by the producers, and so he accepted the part. Among Ra's henchmen was Jimon Honsu in one of his early film roles as Horus. Vivica Lindfors, a lifelong actress of stage and screen, was cast as Dr. Catherine Langford. This was her penultimate role before passing away in 1995. Making up the natives of the planet Abydos was Erika Vari as Kasuf and Alexis Cruz as Skara. The part of Shari proved extremely difficult to cast. The role was still uncast by the time the film started shooting. A matter of days before the character's first scene was to be shot, Emmerich saw an audition tape from actress Millie Avital. She was cast on a Thursday and shot her first scene the following Monday. Location filming took place at Yuma in the Arizona desert, where large sets were built for the base of the pyramid and the Abydosian city. Sand everywhere. On equipment, in equipment, transportation 
is a virtual impossibility. Conditions were harsh, with temperatures of up to 50 degrees Celsius. Although water and shade were in abundance, several cast and crew members passed out from heat stroke. Over 800 extras were used for the crowd scenes. These crowds were further expanded in camera using dummies propped up on sticks and in post with digital crowd members way off in the distance. The alien animal was played by a Clydesdale horse wearing an elaborate suit, which featured an animatronic head. However, due to the lack of visibility and the hefty weight of the costume, the horse was unable to run. For the sequence where Daniel Jackson is pulled along the sand dunes by one of the creatures, a dog was dressed in a smaller version of the animal costume, which dragged an action figure of Jackson behind it. Many shots of the death gliders were captured in camera using forced perspective miniatures hung from cranes. The original design for the gliders was very bulky, the intention of which was to further showcase how advanced the alien technology was, and how it could make even this blocky shape fly. However, in practice, the anvil-shaped craft made for poor shots. Therefore, Patrick Totopoulos suggested adapting the design of a belt piece he had made for Anubis's costume into a more aerodynamic-looking craft. For interior shots, no available soundstage was tall enough for the sets the crew wanted to build, so instead they used the famous Howard Hughes Spruce Goose Hangar in California. Here they built the sets for the Stargate facility, Pyramid Entrance, and Ra's Throne Room. For the ancient language spoken in the film, Dean Devlin insisted it be authentic ancient Egyptian, and so the production hired Egyptologist Dr. Stuart Tyson Smith to create the dialogue. Jay Davidson had tremendous difficulty with the language, and had to read his lines off cue cards after various attempts at using an earpiece failed. Despite the harsh location filming and technical ambitions of the film, Emmerich and Devlin worked hard to keep spirits high, and people generally enjoyed their time on the film. The visual effects were created by the Kleiser Wildcheck Company. Practical techniques were used such as miniatures for the Pyramid, Ra's ship, and the Abydosian city. The Stargate itself was built full scale with motors controlling the rotating hieroglyphs on the ring. The wormhole effect was conceived by digital effects supervisor Jeffrey A. Oaken, but was made up of practical water elements. The gate opening was achieved by filming a tank of water from below the waterline and shooting the water with a compressed air cannon. The swirling wormhole at the back of the Stargate was simply a jar of water being stirred very fast. The shot of Daniel Jackson pushing his head through the Stargate was simply James Spader leaning over a tank of water and putting his face in, and the shot was then rotated 90 degrees. The headdresses on Ra's henchmen were practical animatronics created by Patrick Totopoulos, and the effect of the headpieces folding away was done with a digital morph. The score was composed by David Arnold, Stargate being only his second feature film score. To fit the epic sweep of the story, Arnold took heavy inspiration from Star Wars composer John Williams and Lawrence of Arabia composer Maurice Jarre. He said, When I first read the script for Stargate, I knew what approach to take, which was to be as big and bold as possible. Every time there was an amazing sight, the characters would stand back and say, Oh my god, but James would just smile and walk towards it. That was the basis for the Stargate score, moving forward with a sense of majesty instead of being frightened by what's around the corner. During the editing process, the producers felt the film needed tightening, which forced Emmerich to drop several scenes he was quite fond of. He later restored these scenes to the film in an extended cut, which runs nine minutes longer than the theatrical. The new scenes include an opening in 8000 BC, depicting Ra first landing on Earth and possessing a boy, which is only seen in flashback in the theatrical cut. After five years of development and an ambitious, epic production, Stargate was released on the 28th of October, 1994. If you're enjoying this video and you'd like to see more like it, early, uncut, and ad-free, join my Patreon by following the link in the description. There you can also see exclusive commentaries and video essays for free by joining as a free member. Right now you can watch a companion commentary video for the Stargate movie, which I recorded with Daniel Orrit of the Sojourn and Space Dock fame. All your gods are fake, here are machine guns. <laughs> <laughs> see you over there.
Having first watched Stargate as a young child, I carry a lot of nostalgia for the film, and so I have a lot of goodwill towards it. So even though I'm well aware of its flaws, its shortcomings never overshadow the places where the movie excels. One such place is in its presentation. The film has a wonderfully rich and warm look to it. Even the mundane sets and locations in the first act are given a lot of texture and depth, thanks to cinematographer Carl Lindenlaub's gorgeous lighting. In terms of direction, Roland Emmerich's blocking isn't as strong as it is in Independence Day, here he's too reliant on close-ups, but by the time we get to Abydos, his signature strong eye for composition is used to full effect. Many of the desert shots evoke epic adventures like Lawrence of Arabia, and Emmerich also has a keen eye for action and a strong sense of pacing and rhythm throughout the film. But it's the design work and visual effects which are the true highlights of the film. Like Independence Day, it's that perfect combination of practical and digital effects. Stargate's world is simultaneously familiar yet new. The well-known Egyptian iconography is given a new sci-fi twist to great effect. Ra's henchmen being Egyptian gods made real via robotic headdresses with glowing eyes is an inspired bit of design work. For lack of a better word, the general aesthetic of Stargate is just really cool. The miniature work is executed to a high standard and holds up extremely well. The forced perspective fly-by-wire shots of the Death Gliders look terrific. The Stargate's water motif is another inspired visual idea, which further enhances the sense of wonderment surrounding the titular device. When it comes to the digital effects, it's more of a mixed bag. The CG death gliders cut pretty seamlessly with the practical models, but the headdress transformation effect looks quite dated. Where Stargate is at its weakest is in its storytelling. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with relying on tropes in a high-concept sci-fi movie. In fact, it can work as a strength. But in Stargate, too much of the characterization and plot is either totally by the numbers or needlessly overthought. As good as Kurt Russell's performance is as Jack O'Neill, ultimately the character's backstory of losing his son doesn't add much to the events. It's an attempt at adding depth to the character, his adventure through the Stargate symbolizing his escape from depression, but it's more distracting than interesting. O'Neill ends up relegated to just being sad and stoic throughout most of the film, and as a result, Russell is unable to match James Spader's energy as Daniel Jackson. Spader's performance and the writing for his character feel much more in line with the adventurous spirit of the story. It's also worth noting how Jackson departs from his usual archetype. He's intelligent and nerdy, but he's not awkward or bumbling. Spader's natural gravitas and charisma in the role lends Daniel Jackson an atypical confidence and bravery, which makes him much more entertaining to watch than Kurt Russell's O'Neill. Other cast members worth highlighting are Eric Avari as Kasif and Alexis Cruz as Skara. Like Spader, these two bring enough charisma to their roles to compensate for the thin writing of their characters, and are likable enough to root for. As earnest as Millie Avital is as Shauri, she also isn't given much on the page to work with, and the romance between Shauri and Jackson feels severely underwritten. However, it's Jay Davidson as Ra who steals the show from the rest of the cast. Davidson's background as a model clearly helped his villainous performance as Ra. He wears Ra's plethora of luxurious costumes and accoutrements with striking poise and arrogance. Combined with the distorted voice and occasionally glowing eyes, the film succeeds in conveying Ra's great age, alienness, and power, despite being played by such a young actor. Ra is reason enough to watch the film, as his character is not only at the centre of the most striking design work, but also the most interesting concepts and ideas. And that's where Stargate's true strength lies. Not in the story it tells, but in the world it explores. There's a terrific atmosphere of mystery and wonder which immerses the entire movie from start to finish. Although the second act does slow to a crawl in its later half, the initial exploration of this world is given a huge amount of room to breathe. The coalescence of this adventurous spirit is due in large part to David Arnold's outstanding musical score. The main theme is instantly as iconic to sci-fi fans as John Williams' Star Wars or Jerry Goldsmith's Star Trek. It simultaneously evokes the otherworldly and the ancient, exemplifying the genre, while also being unmistakably Stargate. The choral motifs surrounding the Stargate itself convey such a sense of awe and wonder, whereas Ra's music is just as terrifying as the Stargate motif is wondrous. 
Short, sharp bursts of high strings convey the insidiousness of the alien parasite, while the lower brass embodies the villain's sense of power. But outside these recurring motifs, Arnold's score is utterly captivating in the action cues, running the gambit of whimsical adventure to desperate battle and triumphant victory. Indeed, the final act of Stargate is where the film comes alive. Much of the second act is unfortunately quite dull, but by the time our characters charge in for the final battle, the film finally starts firing on all cylinders. A spectacular ground-to-air battle, an old-fashioned punch-up between O'Neill and Anubis where Kurt Russell finally gets to flex his action hero charisma, and a tense standoff between Jackson and Ra. It's all propelled wonderfully by Arnold's music, and climaxes in some clever gags to defeat Anubis and Ra by using their advanced technology against them. It's just a shame the movie ends just as it gets going. Though it ends abruptly, it at least ends on a high, and manages to leave the audience with a palpable sense of wonder. The sense that we've only seen a tiny glimpse of a vast universe of adventure which still awaits us beyond the Stargate. Upon release, Stargate received rather mixed reviews from critics. Roger Ebert in particular hated the film, while others praised it as a piece of pulpy popcorn entertainment. Audiences, on the other hand, seemed to enjoy it a lot more. Stargate became the sleeper hit of 1994, grossing $196 million worldwide against a budget of $55 million. Stargate may not be known as a great work of storytelling, but its legacy endures thanks to its imagination. It gave audiences a kind of science fiction they had never seen before. While earlier works like Battlestar Galactica also took cues from the infamous Chariots of the Gods, Stargate was a much more overt blend of the ancient and the alien, and its visuals, music, and mythology are still celebrated to this day. Funny about the fans is very often they know the story more than you do, they know details more than you do, and they're amazing. The fans themselves tend to humanize the, the whole experience. I thought these are going to be a, a bunch of crazy people, and, and they're not. The, the, the biggest question I get is, what does Bonnie Way mean? <laughs> Which is sweet. Very sweet. <laughs> Stargate has also been a popular title on home video since its original release, with several releases including the extended cut. The extended cut doesn't hugely improve the movie, but it's the superior version of the film. The prehistoric opening and the scene of O'Neill seeing the fossilized headdresses work well in creating a sense of foreboding and anticipation surrounding the villain. There's also more time spent in this alien world, making it feel more expansive than before. As I said, it's not a huge improvement, but the extra nine minutes lean into the movie's strengths, so it's well worth a watch. Though Emmerich and Devlin soon became busy with other projects, they always saw the potential of revisiting the Stargate universe. While they wouldn't manage to return to Stargate, audiences would enjoy further adventures on the small screen. Thank you for watching, guys. You can all finally stop nagging me to do a Stargate retrospective series. However, the wait for part two in this series will be a little longer than usual, I'm afraid, as I have some other projects I need to be getting on with in February. However, I'm aiming to release part two sometime in March, so stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to stay up to date with new uploads. You can also support me on Patreon, just like all the wonderful people whose names are currently scrolling by. There you can enjoy videos like these early, uncut, and ad-free, as well as some other exclusive content like commentaries and video essays. I'd like to say a big thank you to all of my patrons and an ultra thanks to Charles Borsum, Olivia Computer, Bano, Dent the Air, Extreme Streamers, Tom, Dusk, Colin Camille, Patrick Fleming, Matthew Camille, Ed Mark Starr, Dylan Thomas, Lilac Yane, Howard Craig Akervik, and Caging G. Until next time, have a good one, guys.